My job today, however, is going to be to interview and talk to a guy that I really like a lot and take a lot of crap for it too, by the way. I want you to know that. <laughs> Uh, your your enemies are like my enemies. They they don't want anybody to like the people they don't like. No. You know, um, Joe Solomon, chief police chief of police for the city of Methuen. He's had kind of a rocky road as a, as a police chief. But boy, I'll tell you, he's called into this show a number of times. We've done a number of interviews with him. He's never lied to us. Anytime he has said something was going on, I make three or four phone calls to verify it. Sorry, chief, it's just my job. I get um, it. And and I got to tell you, never once has Chief Solomon told us something and had it turned out not to be true. And this week he tweeted out, I want to make sure I get the right mic, one, two, three, four, okay, so you're up. Uh, he tweeted out this week um, an article and some information about some technology that they're going to be using in Methuen. And this technology is, and I'll let him get into more detail, but I'll give you the flavor of it. This technology is going to be installed in Methuen schools and will detect a gunshot within the school. And I would imagine alert police immediately. I guess it's some kind of like an, an alert alarm system. Um, but I also want to talk to him about a bunch of other things. I want to ask him about NEMLAC. There's a big controversy going on with that, and I think most people don't know what NEMLAC is. So I just kind of want to educate people as to that. And then, if you heard any of our off-the-record discussion when the mic was not supposed to be on, uh, I really want to get into some discussions, depending on how much time he gives us, uh, about the drug situation in Methuen and in the Merrimack Valley. It's not a Methuen issue or a Lawrence issue. Um, and it's not a far away issue. I think it touches every family. And we were having a discussion off the air about you know people that we know that are that are having problems with drugs. Uh, Phil Leahy's been in here a number of times, uh, whose um, daughter was hooked on drugs and has been on a really great campaign to educate families about what's going on. So, Chief, first, let's just say hello. Um, thank you for coming in. I'm a little I'm a little you know disappointed you didn't come in in full dress uniform for my radio show. You know, I mean, I know it's only radio, but we do videotape sometimes and put the videos up online. Um, and I kind of thought I was worth, you know, I, I, I kind of think I deserve full dress uniform, don't, don't you think? You know? Well, you know, I was going to wear a few, Tom, but I went to button it this morning. It was slightly snug, oh, okay. so I decided to dress down yeah. for you. All and the, I, wasn't aware, eating. I didn't, wasn't aware we'd be videotaping <laughs> also. So. Well, it's kind of a new thing. I started, um, people started emailing me saying, you know, I was listening to Candidate X or Y. It's kind of hard to get a flavor on the radio, but you've met them, what do you think? Mm -hmm. And I started to think, well, maybe if we kind of videotape some of the interviews, take the best clips and put them up online, people can see for themselves. I don't ever want to be in a position where I'm trying to convince people what I think. I just want to present the information from my perspective and the perspective of the guest and let them decide for themselves. So I, just, I use it as an additional tool. Um, you don't mind? If you mind, I can no, shut it off. Okay. No, not at all. Sure. And, and, you know, I'd like to just say hello to all your listeners and thank you and WCAP for uh, having me on today. And I know I've called in several times and one thing I really respect about you is regardless of the good times or the bad times, whether we want to hear it or not, <laughs> you tell us the truth. Yeah. So even when it's been information reported on me, but what I did like was at least you did the digging to confirm. And I appreciate that when I say something or I have a conversation with you, that you actually do go out and do the background yeah. because we all make mistakes sometimes and sometimes you've called me back and we'll go back and research info maybe a statistic was wrong but what I found particularly with the ups and downs that I've seen in the past eight years uh, it was nice to have someone report the facts and I like what you said earlier let someone else decide right. you report the facts and let the people decide and, and I think that's a good part about the videotape because you get to see our expressions you get to see our faces um, and, and I think it allows the people to actually hear it and see it because you do need the full flavor of what did the person look like when yeah, they talked. Yeah, it just provides context, I think. I, I agree, and uh, I'd be willing to stay as long as you have questions. Uh, I think this is a great source of getting information out. And everything you talk about is, you know, in the news and it is important. Um, we've done a significant amount of work in the... Uh, drug rehabilitation and education area and unfortunately every single day that we make arrests after arrest so I think every subject you mentioned is is important I think we should talk about them all excellent well I'm glad I'm glad you're here it is the day after a holiday there's a lot of people away but surprisingly you, I mean you would you would be amazed I know I am every time I look at the numbers online I think we really have more people listening online after the show when we post the podcast than we have listening live sometimes um, just we we, we kind of know what the numbers are the live numbers although they'll they'll never tell us officially because <laughs> they, they don't want Warren to know that we have way more listeners than he does <laughs> but um, but when I look at the online hits that this podcast gets I'm always surprised and we also get the stats on where it's from 
we had people from China, people from India, people from Israel, people from Saudi Arabia, all kinds of people from the United Kingdom. And I don't know if they're veterans who are stationed other places who are listening, you know, back home to what's going on. Uh, but we have really a very diverse um, listening audience here at this radio program, and I'm glad that you're here. Well, and, and personally, I've read some of your articles and then gone on the website to listen to it myself. Oh, because really? you read the story and you say, okay, and you said you've posted podcasts, so and, and it's it just proves true to what you say. We want to hear it ourselves and see it. So I've gone on, I've listened to your uh, just the the audio of a podcast and I've also watched some of the video so uh, I think it is a great tool and you know with the schedules we all keep sometimes I can't listen at, to a certain show at a certain time and you know that's why we have DVRs at home right. so uh, I think the podcast is a great idea and uh, we've used a lot of uh, YouTube videos when we've had situations occur and a month later I'll get views on the YouTube video and then someone will comment and they'll bring up good points that we'll go back and look at. So yeah. it, the good thing is it's always there. So it might be a year from now, but somebody will see it because they're interested in it. They do a Google on your subject and they find it. Right. So let's get into um, the main reason why you're here. And I, I'm, I'm actually kind of chomping at the bit for the, for the second and third topic. But let's, let's do this because it is kind of fascinating. Explain to my listeners what the new type of technology is and what it's going to do once it's installed in, in the, before we start is it going to go in all the schools or just going to have like a pilot school it's expand? going to be a pilot school and uh, we're not going to mention which school it is because of the study right um we're also working with two other communities in the area and i know that information has an uh been made public yet we're going to wait for those communities we asked them to join in with us so initially it'll just be in a pilot school in Methuen and we're working on a grant for the Department of Justice to make it a little bit of a regional attack on this problem and then also uh, we're working with a, a public university which at this point we can't name who's going to do a research study for us right so what is the technology exactly what is it that it does sure well I, I think uh, the interesting part is in, inside indoor detection is new but this is a tried and true technology it really comes out of uh, the boomerang and the boomerang X which was developed through a defense contractor and has been used overseas for years uh, by our military and what it does is it's a little um, circular device that you wear on your shoulder and when the uh, Marines mainly the Marines are using it, special forces are out in the field and a gunshot is fired from a mile away or 200 feet away it on a little window that they carry in front of them they can look at it, it gives you the GPS coordinates it also gives you the clock wow. points so we were able to obtain a couple of those and we gave them to our special operations team and we did some testing with them and then I was approached by a former Marine um, who works for a, a large uh, defense contractor and said they in, they were interested in trying to take Boomerang X technology, which is uh, acoustics um, analysis, and taking the acoustic algorithms in the Boomerang and try to convert it to an indoor shot detection system. So a, about two years ago, maybe 18, 19 months ago, we started working with this company. We did multiple tests inside our school uh, at night during or during the weekend during the day we tested a variety of different weapons we tested everything from handguns to assault weapons uh, we tested them uh, with as they made we tested them with muzzle uh, suppressors to suppress the fire and then we tested them with silences that also acted as a muzzle suppressor and we wanted to see does a different design or modification prevent the system from actually detecting a shot and all the shots that we fired in the thousands uh, it detected all of our shots. It all has, of them, 100%. All of them. We wow. had no shot not detected. Wow. Um, the interesting thing was, as we worked through it, they would um, tweak the algorithm. So as we worked through the final product, I should say, calcu uh, was able to pick up every single one of our shots. And what we liked was, it can identify a shot from a muzzle flash or from the sound. And this has dual capability, so we can compare the two to confirm that it's a shot. We also then collected about a large amount of white data, uh, white noise. We just collected what does it sound like when a book drops? What does it sound like? I was just going to ask you that. Like, what, what about this you know, is something, what's that, important. something that sounds like a gunshot? You know, could it set that off? Right. And well, we have not had that happen as of this point. So. 
books falling, desks up, opening, closing, kids walking, uh, banging on a wall, slamming a door. We did all these tests too. And the technology, again, I'm not a scientist, but um, the engineers were telling us the acoustic algorithm is what the trick is. And that acoustic algorithm was able to calculate the range for a gunshot. So this is the low where a shot comes in, this is the high. So it knows that if it's in that range, that it's a gunshot. And then it confirms that by reading the IR sensor, the infrared sensor, reads the flash suppressor. So it can compare the two and say, yes, they're both within the range, it is a shot. So that was a significant amount of work, just going in the school, you know, being undetected, doing it at nights and weekends, so you can do nighttime and daytime shooting. And collecting all this data, getting it back to the engineers, um, the engineers were with us when we did this. Uh, we used a team of officers. Everybody has been uh, through uh, a SWAT 1 and SWAT 2 tactical class. Everyone were marksmen and uh, everyone was a member of a special operations team so that we didn't have to worry about stray rounds in a school because we wanted to cover every single um, basis that we had. We didn't want kids coming to school and finding you know, holes in walls. Right, right. So we had to do it the right way. So and, let, me, let me slow you down because I know you're on a roll here. Um, so how does it work? You've got a, a school building has multiple classrooms, multiple closets, multiple areas that echo differently. Uh, and I'm only asking out of ignorance because I don't I don't know how this technology works. Um, so if someone's in a classroom, ten classrooms away, is is I guess what I'm asking is is this detection system is it going to be in every room in a school or is it just centrally located somewhere that can detect everything within that building? Well, those are good questions, Tom. And um, the schools have the ability to do it any way they want. Um, it, to have complete coverage, and it's still because they're still tweaking the uh, coverage, we're anywhere between 25 to 50 meters that can cover. So whether it's one in each classroom or two in each classroom, or whether the, the school decides we just want to do the corridors outside the classroom so it can still pick up the sound, because it obviously would be between 25 and 50 meters if it was in the corridor. Um, you when you say meters, we're, we're all American. We don't understand that. that, that is it? What is a meter? Is it 50 meters to be what, like 50 yards? Yeah, well, you know, to be honest with you, I don't know the exact Right. Um, but just don't get people in their But mind. in the approximate for, for their minds, you we're talking anywhere from our testing that we've seen to, um, you know, 30 feet to 150 feet, okay. somewhere in that range. Somewhere that Depending, again, are you around a corner and behind, you know, another solid wall. So, um, of course, because the engineers all use meters, those are the statistics right, yeah. numbers that they gave us. And we've actually mapped them out so we know where they are. Converting it to feet is a little bit tricky question. Sorry. That's about where we fall. I just wanted the people right listening now. to kind of get an idea in their head for what kind of a distance we're talking about. Okay, and uh, also because I know nothing about metrics. Okay, no problem. And um, and I'll be be corrected if anybody knows the actual conversions, and I can look them up for you later on. But based on the the distances I've saw, seen them put in place, that's what we think. Now you can also just do your main entrances, your hallways, your cafeterias. It's up to each school where they want to tweak it. When we test it, we want to test it with uh, as close to full distribution as possible. And I think really the way we're trying to explain it is as a smoke detector for gunshots. Because people are well, familiar with smoke it. detectors, yeah. and it, it, it helps you in your head say, you know what, we have a smoke detector and a carbon monoxide detector. Who doesn't have one? Right. Why wouldn't we want a shot detection system? Now, it's not the end-all, be-all to anything, uh, but it's one more layer. And in Methuen, we've been talking for years, since the early 90s, we like the layers of defense. Right. Not only do we want a buzzer at the door, but we want a camera at the door. We also want the doors locked. We want certain doors to have swipe keys so that if we needed to respond we could swipe in and out. We want other doors to have a mechanical key lock for other reasons. Uh, we like to have um, cameras placed in strategical locations. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we like you have co are, are there cops in the Methuen schools now? Do you have a, a safety officer in like Methuen High School? Yes, we're actually you know very lucky in, in Methuen that uh, we have a police officer in every single school. Not only do we have an officer in every single school when it's open, we have a sergeant who's assigned to supervise the school officers and visit every school. So there's, we had six schools. Because the media tells us that's not the answer and that, that, that doesn't work, right. but uh, not to get off track, you have proof that it does work, don't you? Oh, we absolutely do. And because it isn't, and, and per se, this isn't about just a, being able to stop a shooter or reduce the, the outcome of a shooter. It, it's about building the relationships and it's about behavioral analysis. And when an officer is working a school, 
they form a relationship with the students, the good students and the bad students, the teachers and the faculty. But it's also, as you said, hey, what do I look like when I'm talking? And can you evaluate me better by seeing me? Well, when the school officer is walking through the building, and we may be watching a specific student, maybe a faculty member, um, he gets to see the behavior of that student, the interactions with other students, and say, you know what? Now I feel that I need to step in and do something more. So it's not just about walking around the school with a gun. It's about being the whole package. Right. Being a teacher, getting in classrooms and teach, forming relationships. And I believe it's about situational awareness and behavioral analysis. Mm -hmm. Walking through the school, and we all went to school and we all said, wow, that kid could always go postal. Right, and yeah. we always had every, the kid, every we class thought I was everyone had someone kid. that went postal, that we thought could go postal. What we did find out is most of the time it wasn't that kid. It was the other introverted, shy kid right. in the corner. But having a school officer in the school, and it's interesting because as situations arise and we start doing investigations, you know, we've had incidents where we've had threats at the school. Yes. We call our school officers in at 10 o'clock at you night. You guys stopped a call them by because you guys had an officer in one of the schools. And, and it works. And we've called in officers and said, hey, listen, this is what we know. This, 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 and this. Who do you think could be this person? And they'll give us three or four names. And lo and behold, it's one of those people that we received a message from through their investigation. So um, it's truly important to have an officer in every single school. So we had six schools up until now. Uh, starting in um, September, we'll be down to five schools because the central high school is closing. Everyone's going to the new high school. So we'll have five full-time school officers, one full-time sergeant. So we're excited about, I believe we're the first in Massachusetts. I know we're the first in Massachusetts, and I would bet we're pretty close to the first, if not the first in the country, to have a police officer at every single school. 978-454-4980. If you would like to get in and ask questions of Methuen Police Chief Joe Solomon. How long have you been a chief? Since 2002. So, uh, years. okay, I went a long time, my mask life is not that good. And how long have you been a cop? Uh, 28 years. So 28 years a police officer, at least tw oh, wait, 12 years as a police chief. Folks, this is the guy who knows his stuff. He's not a politician, he doesn't run for office. He's not out there trying to push um, gun bans, and he's not out there trying to push a political, a liberal or conservative agenda. He's only here to tell us what's real on the ground, and you don't get that in most media. Most media, you've got the talking heads of the left and the right, and they're, and they're talking abstractly about whether or not we should put guns in schools, what works, what doesn't work. But they don't actually have first-hand real experience. And that's why I like to bring newsmakers in like police chiefs and people who are on the ground. Because they can tell you from first-hand experience, from trial and error, what works, what doesn't work, and what their experience is. Bob, you are uh, on the line with uh, Police Chief Joe Solon. Bob, you are on the line with Police Chief Joe Solon. Going once, going twice, Bobby T, hello? He's gone, 978-454-4980. Uh, we have a question on Twitter from Joe. Joe wants to know, is Methuen a sanctuary city, and how does the Methuen Police Department work with immigration when you arrest somebody who's an illegal alien? Uh, well, what we tough do, question right out it, of the it is a tough question, and, uh, and I know that Secure Communities has been <laughs> a, a subject of debate on both sides, and what we do is we follow the law, and the law is when we make an arrest, we fingerprint our prisoners. We enter your fi the fingerprints into the FBI system. What the FBI does is the FBI then runs those fingerprints through the ICE um, detainer um, database. If ICE is interested in detaining a prisoner, then they would contact the Methuen Police Department and we would cooperate with them. I think the confusion in the political rhetoric around um, secure communities is that we randomly pick people out in the street. Right. If you're an illegal uh, immigrant in this community and you've been a victim of a crime, feel free to call us because guess what? We're not going to fingerprint you, we're not going to run you through the system, but whether you're here legally or you're here illegally, if you get arrested, we're fingerprinting you, right. we're running your fingerprints through the system. So only those arrested. So we're not de designated as a sanctuary, and yet we are not a secure community designation that we go out and look for right. illegal immigrants. But if you've been charged with a crime and under arrest, we will run your fingerprints. And if ICE asks us to detain you, and it's a detainment based upon a criminal charge, we will detain you. Now, with all the political rhetoric aside, because we know what the media propaganda is, we know what the Republicans and the conservatives say, on the ground, what do you see? What is the result? If you have you been able to take violent people who are illegal aliens, uh, run this 
fingerprints through the system? Have ICE come in and say, this is a really bad guy, we need to take this guy out? Absolutely, we have, and we have not in Methuen, and, and you know, we were one of the big community policing departments, and we've converted that over to quality policing. We have a good relationship with our community, and there isn't anyone in our community that we've run into that's been afraid to talk to us. And we have had situations where an illegal immigrant is a victim, so we tell them, it's okay, we're not here, that's not our job. Yeah, you're not fingerprinting victims, you're not, not fingerprinting people who come in to file complaints about um, sexual assault or Absolutely domestic not. violence. It's once people are arrested for Only crime. when they're arrested. And we have had situations in the past where we've run fingerprints and there's been no hit on the FBI and the person is Joe Solomon. And a day and a half later, while he's being held on other charges, ICE will call us and say, hey, this just flagged. By the way, this is so-and-so who's already been deported twice. And we'll say, yeah, he's being held in Middleton on our charges. So sometimes it even helps you identify someone. And everyone thinks that we do these fingerprints and snap. <clears throat> ICE is at our door. Right. You may get a call in five minutes. This is a person who's been wanted for murder. Right. And bang, right away we get the call. But on the other charges, it's a day, maybe a day and a half later. And if they've already been released, we provide ICE with the info. And it's up to them to go track the go person down. So we guys... don't go running around chasing after them to pick them up on an immigration case. However, to be fair, if ICE came into our department and said, hey, we need to go find these six people, we treat them just like the FBI, the DEA, the Lawrence Police, or the Haver Police. We go help them because we're law enforcement officers. Uh, this is a fascinating discussion because what we hear every day in mainstream media, what we hear every day from cable news media and from certainly the Democrat Party and the propagandists who want to take away guns, who want to let all the illegals in, whatever their political agenda is, is a very different story than what we see live on the ground. And I tell my friends all the time, I usually use Lawrence as an example when we talk about welfare and illegal aliens, but Methuen is a predominantly white community, still has the same problems. These problems are not isolated to Lawrence. And if you look at what goes on on the ground, it does not comport with what the politicians say is going on in America, and it does not comport with what the media says is going on in the ground in America. And I'm, I'm fascinated that you have um, encountered people that ICE has come in and said, these are very dangerous guys, we've got to remove them, we've got to you know, start the deportation process and pick them up. Um, but people who have uh, been victims of domestic violence or people who have been victims that come to file a police report, they're not being fingerprinted and just willy-nilly thrown on a plane and sent out of the country the way it's portrayed. Oh, absolutely not. And I can't speak for other departments or other parts of the country, but it absolutely is not happening here. And we value everybody. Everybody, you know, really, how many of us aren't immigrants? My grandparents on both sides, all four, were born in Lebanon and mm -hmm. all immigrated to the United States. And now I have a good life because of them coming here. Mm -hmm. We're all immigrants at some time um, in our life, in our generation. So sure. and we absolutely, a victim is a victim is a victim. And one of the things that aggravates me, and I've had these conversations with law enforcement all the time, how does a victim become the suspect? And how do suspects become victims sometimes? Right. I want to make sure if you're a victim, you're a victim. Now, if you're a victim, but you've also done something, like, you know, maybe you're a victim and you've been assaulted, but you were assaulted because you just broke into someone's house and right. stabbed them. Right. Well, we're going to treat you as a victim. We're going to get you your aid, but we're also going to charge you. Right. You just might not be arrested, but you're still going to be charged. And we see in Lawrence all the time, people who go looking to buy drugs, you know, come upon some unsavory character, ask them to buy drugs, and they get robbed. Correct. But, you know, you were there to either source a prostitute or to buy drugs, you're a victim. You're also a suspect. You've also committed a crime. Correct. So there is But the, unless you're arrested though, you're saying they don't get fingerprinted. We don't fingerprint them unless we do not fingerprint anyone unless they're arrested, except in some cases if there's a gang situation we're dealing on, we legally can take someone's fingerprints on the scene so we can compare them maybe to other fingerprints we have. But there has never been a case in my twelve years uh, that we fingerprinted someone to see if the person is a legal immigrant. And I think that, my personal opinion, is that stepping on people's civil rights. And I know it's not a civil rights violation, but you have a right to live here and you have a right to be free. The federal government's job is to control um, immigration. immigration. And now, we're going to cooperate with them when they want to go get somebody who's a violent criminal, but it's not our job to go hurt people. And now I know that can hurt me on both sides. Right, sure. Some people believe we should be hurting everybody out, and other people believe we shouldn't be hurting anyone out. But you know what? 
what's our job? What's our responsibility? Serve and protect and enforce the laws of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and the city of Methuen. And that's what we do. Right. We will continue to always do that. And please, if we don't, call us on it. And sometimes, as, as Tom, you know, we've had these conversations. Just because I'm the chief, I don't know everything. Right. I might not know what happened Friday night at 3 o'clock in the morning. Sh- and sometimes you've called me and told me, and I'm like, yeah, Tom, I don't think so, but let me make a call. And I call you back and say, you have better sources than me. <laughs> so, you know, maybe that's the I'm always surprised. Face, like but- with the uh, Sahara Club shooting, I called you and said, I think it was, I don't know, like to 1 o'clock in the morning. And and I felt bad because you sounded like I'd woken you up. Yeah. And by the way, thank you for always taking my call at 2 o'clock in the morning. And I said, Chief, did you guys just have a murder over at the Sahara Club? And you said, I, I don't think so, but let me make a call. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so people think that because you're Chief, you know everything. Like, right. you, you instantly have an instant pipeline to everything going on 24-7, but you sleep too. You have days right. off too. And I'm lucky enough that I have a great staff. I have good captains and good lieutenants who take turns being in charge and when they're in charge of their bureau they take all the calls they handle the situation and similar to the Sahara afterwards maybe two three o'clock in the morning four o'clock they would have called and said this is a situation it's under control this is what we had and at that point they brief me so I'm lucky enough to have a good command staff that they don't have to call me every 15 minutes and you know we believe in the executive development principle they have to make their decisions and I have to live with sometimes mistakes are made or bad decisions are made and that follows with me but that's life and you have to trust your people because if you do everything you become a dictator right it just it, it doesn't work yeah 978-454-4980 we're gonna take a quick break when we come back i want to ask chief solomon give us a little details on that execution that happened at the sahara club i don't believe they've made an arrest of the person who's guilty of the person who did it um still i think a fascinating case there have been some developments. We reported on them, then I got my rear end kicked for reporting on them. You know, there's also some DEA cases in Methuen the last couple of years, and uh, I apologize to our friends at the Drug Enforcement Agency for posting photos. I didn't realize the, the, the cars on the lawn were actually DEA cars. I thought they were like the cars of the people they were arresting, and we put them up and the plate numbers were on them. We had to pull them down immediately, and I apologize for that. Sometimes in the news business, you don't have all the facts either, and you're taking pictures and you're posting them and not realizing what's up there. So we'll talk about a couple of those things. And then I want to get into some other stuff. I really want to talk about the drug epidemic uh, in Massachusetts, in this country, the drug cartels that are taking advantage of people, and what it means for families in Methuen and Lawrence in the Merrimack Valley back after this. On paying attention where everybody gets it, even Methuen Police Chief Joe Solomon. In the studio, we have... Methuen Police Chief Joe Solomon, we've touched on a number of subjects. We've talked about the shooter detection system, we've talked about uh, illegal immigration and ICE. Um, I understand that maybe at the top of the hour, right after news, we may have the uh, someone from the company, shooter detection system, calling in to talk about how this technology works. Correct. The uh, owner, Chris Christian Connors uh-huh. of shooter detection systems, should be calling in around 11 o'clock. That's great. In the meantime, um, do you want to stay on this topic, or do you want to just bounce around until he calls in? Uh, well, if we could just talk a little bit more about it, sure. and then uh, we'll move on. Because I think the important part is that that this is an integration system. So it, it's we we're glad because we were able to be on the ground floor to help develop it, and I think that says a lot because. Uh, we got to put in the law enforcement aspect and the school aspect as to what you'd like to see, and the school aspect being nondescript so it's installed nobody can tell it's there so it's not disruptive to students and I think that's important Um, it also goes hand in hand with the uh, training that we've been giving we've trained all the faculty staff uh, uh, at this point into uh, an emergency response system that includes lockdown and evacuation which runs hand in hand with the uh, shooter detection system but from being able to test the system and seeing what it can do, we, we had made some suggestions. And some of the suggestions were that it allows an immediate alert because the biggest problems police have is what is the time that it takes from something to occur for it to be reported? And then once it's reported and the police arrive at the scene, how much time is it from arrival to time to contact because now the person has moved? Right. And the advantage of this system is it's automated. So. You, what we always call the OODA loop, someone has to observe something, they have to orient to it, they have to decide what it is that they saw, they have to take some action. And all that wrapped in for a layperson in a shooting situation could take a significant amount of time. There may be 30 seconds to a minute delay. With the system being automated, as soon as the gunshot 
is detected, it'll send an emergency alert out. It'll go to all our cruises and our laptops. It'll go to um, either text messaging or apps on our phones. And it'll go. So automatic. This is automatic. The gunshot goes off. You don't have to wait for someone to pick up the phone and call the, call 911 and say, we just heard a gunshot in our building. Correct. It takes the human error out and, and it reduces and even, the time. Even though that could be seconds, those seconds could save children's lives. Oh, absolutely. And, and in a situation like this, it turns out not to be seconds. It turns out to be longer because someone has to run for cover because they just saw what happened. They have to get somewhere safe. They're shaking. they got to get their phone out. And then what we found is when they call, they're either whispering or they're hysterical. And it takes you a while to calm them down. So if you could save 30 seconds to a minute up to sometimes some of the first calls that have come in in shooting scenes at schools have been three minutes. Mm -hmm. Think of the amount of devastation you could reduce. The second part is, not only is it sending out an alert, but and again, it's modular, so you don't have to have this, but you have the ability to have microphones turn on and a camera turn on in each system, and now it you can listen to what's going on in the school, you could hear where the shots are, and as if more shots were fired, it gives you the locations in the school because each one of them is either going to have a GPS location or a school location. So as you're responding, it'll say um, system one outside classroom 340 or the GPS location so it'll direct us to it. Now you arrive at a school three to five minutes later and all of a so sudden... So if you move to a different classroom and you shot somebody else again, you've that got that system additional goes data. Off. Right. So that system will go off. So it helps you guide it. And then um, one of the other things that will allow you to do is to talk to the person through the system. And if you look at the psychologies, um, when most shooters that are active killers, I'm not going there to kill just Tommy Duggan because he upset me. I'm right. going there to do mass killing. Right. When they're confronted and someone interjects themselves either physically or just they hear sirens of cruises coming or they hear the police are here or someone tells them, the majority of them end it at that point by committing suicide. Now, not that we want Which is somebody, a good thing, I think. Well, and, and not that I want anyone to I know, you can't say that, but I can. But if they stop the shooting, whichever way they stop it, that's good for us. Right. So by us getting on it and saying, hey, you know, sir, we see you in the white shirt with the green pants with the gun. You're in corridor A. You don't turn the corner. The police officers around the corner, they're coming to get you. Put down your gun, give up. They don't want to give up control. So they have to take their own lives because that's the final control. Right. So all these different technologies that have been that we've made suggestions that they've agreed to incorporate, you don't have to have them in your in your school if you don't want them, or your library, or your radio station, or your police station, or your government building. We definitely, we definitely need everywhere. one of these in the Valley Patriot offices. Uh, I, I think based <laughs> on some of your reporting, you should have one on your shoulder when you're walking around. But the different technology there, and I think the important things is reducing the human element. and eliminating it so it's automated and number two reducing once I arrive on the scene I know from my dispatch or from my laptop or from my app where that person has moved to and I, I it's just remarkable that we're at this point and when we first started working with the company two years ago we were saying all these ideas we we're saying this is a great idea what about this but too bad technology doesn't exist and the answer is oh yeah technology exists it's in the military we just need to be able to utilize it so um, Thank God, you know, knock on wood for our military and for the millions and millions of dollars of research and development that went into the Boomerang X, which is the heart and soul of the Guardian. So this isn't just some system that was developed out of thin air. It was a military This wasn't some kid in his basement who came up with a good idea. This is years of technology that was developed by the, by the military. Absolutely. And years of testing it out in an actual battlefield and tweaking it to the point that we know it works in the outside. And here's an even further advantage to that. Now we know we have an indoor shot to detection system. There's also an outdoor shot detection oh, that's system great, great. because you can take the Guardian and the, I'm sorry, you can take the, um, the boomerang and there's a conversion of the boomerang that works outside. And you, you can have an indoor-outdoor system if you so wanted to. So, so it's many, many different So here's levels. what I'm envisioning, because th this is this fascinating. The, I, the more I talk to you, the more I'm fascinated by this. I, I really kind of had a, like a general interest when you first called me on this, but now I'm completely fascinated. So we have in, in Methuen and in Lawrence area, it's right on the border of the Arlington neighborhood, which has been always probably the biggest crime problem in Methuen. You can correct me if I'm wrong on that. You guys have done some amazing work reducing the crime thanks to... Ah, What's her name? Linda Susie. Linda, I'm sorry, I, Linda. I apologize. In I love the whole Arlington so neighborhood. I, and I love Linda so much. It was just, it was just a brain freeze. Thanks to people like Linda Susie. Thanks to the Methuen uh, Arlington neighborhood group. 
you guys have done some amazing job uh, uh, reducing crime there. However, now I'm getting visions in my head of using a boomerang system or this gunshot detection system on a telephone pole on a street corner in the Arlington neighborhood so that even if there isn't a witness to call 911, if somebody does a drive-by shooting, if somebody, if somebody pulls a gun on someone and shoots them during a drug deal, you guys automatically, right away, that second will know. Correct. And, you know, in the conversations with the company, they have already deployed in other locations tests for the external system. But from what I know and from my reading just about the military, it's already been in use. And, in fact, you could f see pictures of Hummers overseas with these huge in microphones that look like this, of course, in the OD green. Right. Those are external shot detection systems built off that Boomerang X. And I'm sure uh, if Chris gets to call in at 11, uh, he can explain that. But those are one of our visions, too. And again, we don't want to scare people right. that say that, hey, there is a need for this. But what we always say is it's multiple levels of defense. I hope that uh, generations to come, this is never, ever used and it's installed and never goes off. There's never a need for it. Yeah. There's never a need for it. But if it's there, why not use it? Right. Whether it's inside, outside, combination of it. And that's the same reason to say, well, maybe we don't need 10 offices working because for calls for services, we can handle them with six. But God forbid a situation arrives, rises, you want to have those people. Just like when we had the fireworks. We don't have eight police officers there, we have 30 police officers there. So God forbid some type of a situation occurs, as simple as the storm rolling in. Right. And being able to make a decision as the mayor did to shoot the fireworks early, but then have 30 officers to run traffic posts to help people get out and get home and be safe. So one of the things sometimes my critics say is, Joe Solomon likes to look at worst case scenario. Well, you can't do law enforcement if you look at best case scenario right, right. because then you're behind the scenes. Well, that's you the, need that's to the be political forward. That, that 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 that's the that's the political problem with America today is that we wanna we wanna pretend a threat may never happen. You know, um, I remember Jay Carney, uh, the uh, president spokesman, at one point last year said the borders are secure. We've secured the borders. We're not worried. It's not gonna happen. We're not gonna have a flood of people coming over the border. Well, uh, then it happened, right? right. Had they been more proactive and thought more like you and didn't have a political agenda on the, on the side, and they'd said, look, what's the worst case scenario? What happens if 10,000 Mexicans storm the border all at once? Are we prepared for that? We're not prepared for that. If they had your idea, your model of thinking, we would be prepared for that. And what's going on right now in America wouldn't be happening. Well, you know, thanks for saying that. And, and I, you know, I agree with you uh, on many different uh, points there and I really believe that the advantage to being the cop and not the politician is I don't have to worry about the political views. Right. It may harm me because people may be upset over it but my, I have a job and my job is to worry about law enforcement. Right. So you may not lives. agree and you may not agree politic you might think it's a bad political statement particularly even talking about secure communities. Nobody wants to talk about right. it, but you know what? We do what we need to do. We do what we need to do by looking at technologies like this and trying to work together as a team to say, you know, what can we envision happening in two or three years? Because this is a long-term project. All right, we got to, we have to um, take a quick news break. We'll be back with the Police Chief Joe Solomon. We're going to talk a little bit more about drugs in the Merrimack Valley. We're going to talk about the recent almost school shootings at Methuen High School and what he and his department did to prevent it. Back after this, I'm paying attention where everybody gets it. Even Joe Dunn from Tuchberry. <laughs> big boss man. All right, we're talking about the big boss man of Methuen. He is Methuen Police Chief Joe Solomon. 28 years as a police officer, putting his life on the line to protect the people of Methuen. 12 years as the chief. And by the way, still putting his life on the line. I've gone to fires. I've gone to shootings. I've gone to drug arrests. I follow police calls in the Merrimack Valley myself. I'm like almost every other reporter out there that calls himself a reporter. And I have seen Joe Solomon at the scene of events when the guys are ready to go in, and he's going in with them. He's not the guy that says, I'm going to sit in the, I'm going to be the commander in the back that directs everybody. He's one of the first guys in the door when his guys are going in. And just because he's a police chief doesn't mean he's not putting his life on the line. So thank you, chief, for putting your life on the line, not just for the people of Methuen, Sometimes you guys chase people into Lawrence, chase people into Salem, New Hampshire, and you're on the scene too, and I appreciate that. You're welcome. Thank you. On the line we have, what's his name, uh, Chris Pavillon? Chris Connors. Chris Connors is on the line. He is from uh, the uh, gunshot detection system, right? Is it, yeah, shooter detection system. Shooter detection system. 
Uh, Chris, are you with us? Yes, I am. Good morning. Uh, I don't know if you had a chance to listen to the beginning of the show. We've been talking with Police Chief Joe Solomon from Methuen uh, about this system that they're going to be testing in the Methuen schools and in other areas in Massachusetts. And I'm really fascinated by this technology. I wasn't when we started the conversation. But as it has evolved, as this conversation has developed, um, we've learned that not only is this good for using in schools for school shootings, but it's also something that you can put on telephone poles in maybe bad neighborhoods so that the second a gunshot goes off, police are immediately notified. Can you talk about that? Uh, yes, we're not in that market currently, but it's something we're certainly looking at to combine both the outdoor capabilities that uh, we work with as well as the indoor gunshot and combining those to have a, uh, an urban product. All right, well, thanks for calling. Good night. No, I'm just kidding. You there? Can you hear me? Yes, I'm here. Oh, good morning. Uh, I was looking for a little bit longer of an answer, but that's okay. The chief... Um, the, the chief wanted to have you on, and I'm glad that you're here. Can you talk about how this technology works? How does this how does this work? The chief talked a little bit about in uh, the Department of Defense when the military is using it. Kind of looks like a microphone on the on the Humvees. What does it look like when you're using it for urban settings? And actually, what we what we did was take the military capability and, and they put it in a very benign looking box that looks the same as um, like a switch or an outlet that you have. So it fits into a standard electrical box, can be screwed in and, and uh, up and running in a couple seconds. So what we try to do is obviously for schools you don't want to have anything too threatening looking so we took that capability and, and made sure it looked um, and again non-threatening similar to what they would see today on, on the walls of the schools and how does the techno how does the technology actually work I'm not a I'm not a techno geek but maybe you can kind of dumb it down for those of us who aren't uh, who aren't techno geeks sure and, and I'm not either so um, uh, I work with a lot of smart guys but I'm not one of them so what, what's been developed over the last you know, 10, 15 years with the Department of Defense and Dogler and the prime contractor that we bought the technology from was basically to write uh, the world's best algorithms, that you know, software that can understand and listen for the sound of a gunshot and pick that out from, from other noises, which is the key. You can't have false alerts, especially in schools, but you know, even the military, of course. And then what we did was to validate, that's a, an extremely accurate um, uh, software, but then we validate that software what it hears with the two infrared cameras that are in the uh, system. They're actually infrared sensors and not cameras. And that looks for the muzzle flash. So when a weapon's fired, there's even in a silenced weapon, there is some energy that comes out the front of the weapon. So we combine both listening and looking and then uh, immediately let everyone know that a shot has occurred in that area. 978-454-4980 is the phone number if anyone would like to call in with a question for Methuen Police Chief. Joe Solomon or Chris Connors from is it is the name of the company Shooter Detection System? I want to get at least right at least once during the show. <laughs> no, that's, that's fine. I appreciate it. It is a Shooter Detection Systems. And so, how how was your company formed? Are you guys a bunch of former military guys that saw this stuff being used out in the field and said, "Hey, this would be great to use in, in urban settings"? Yes. What um, what we looked at is I headed up all the business development for the military system. Um, so we brought that to market, and you know, Secretary of Defense Gates actually signed only about six orders the whole time he was Secretary of Defense, and and this was the last one. So we certainly understood the criticality of getting this out to the field fast and helping save soldiers' lives, of which you know the Senate report two hundred lives saved more. by the military system. So um, we looked at that and um, talked to the contractor that owned it and decided it was, it was something we wanted to bring to market for schools and buildings, especially in light of all the uh, recent uh, activity of, of building shootings, including in the government, you know, the Navy Yard had that shooting as well. And what we kept hearing over and over was, we didn't know how many shooters there were, it took minutes to have someone call the police, and then when we arrived, there was really no way for us to know where the shooter was currently located. So we took the military system and tried to incorporate, you know, Chief Solomon and, and other police chiefs and superintendents that we spoke with and safety officials, um, and then brought it to market. We do have um, a significant portion of the company are retired Navy, Navy SEALs that have just gotten out. So certainly they've helped us to be able to um, both understand the security piece, how to secure a building, as well as what to do with the information uh, that comes out of the box. So I think they've been invaluable helping us uh, bring the product to market. Have you had any success um, with this technology in any actual urban or suburban settings in schools, or is it still just really in the developmental stage? Yeah, no, so it's, it's in between the two. So we bought the company, or started the company up in November of last year. Um, we took the military capability, which was great, but it was too expensive, obviously. So we've spent the last six months uh, redesigning the box so it would be at a commercial price point. And now we're at that point where we're ramping up in production and starting to um, outfit uh, both Lithuan and some other locations as well. Now, um, I'm going to be writing a story for our newspaper on this. It'll be out on Tuesday. 
Um, we're going to give you guys tons of free free publicity. You guys are located in Newburyport? Yeah, in Raleigh, a little bit south of Newburyport. Okay, we're, we're actually in Raleigh, in the Market Basket in Raleigh, so you'll be able to pick the paper up if you live in that area. Great. Um, we only ask that, like, with all of these billions and billions of dollars you're going to be making with all these government grants, that you think of us in the future, because we're a free paper, we survive on advertising. All right, we definitely will. Chief Solomon, do you have any, any questions you'd like to ask Chris to try and get a little bit more information out to the people who... Even Chris Poubelon, who is a y much younger guy who normally is kind of bored by our political conversations, says said during the break he's fascinated by all this because he's got two kids in, in public school system. No, that's great. Uh, good morning, Chris. Good morning, Chief. How are you? Good. Chris, I think, you know, uh, I touched on a lot of how the system works, and you've just given them an overview. But what I found very interesting myself and personally, I think, from the parents I spoke to that they find deeply is the real reason... Uh, for putting this system into schools and you know when, when you had talked earlier before um, on one of the newscasts about why you wanted to see this system in schools do you want to just touch on that so it's it's less about the technology and what was the real purpose you were trying to gain sure and I have two school age children myself um, Coleman and Lily and, and they're in two different schools uh, locally so when, when you hear about these events and, and you hear what the problems were, um, we thought this was applicable to help address that. And, and again, if I'm repeating myself, I'm sorry. But when you look at, say, Sandy Hook, where it was six minutes almost for someone to call the police and the last shooting and, and you know death occurred ten minutes after it started, if you just do the simple math and you could save those six minutes, um, I think lives, children's lives would have been saved. So. We almost looked at it as an obligation. We're still working with the military systems as well, but we looked at it as an obligation to bring this to market and, and get it in the hands of, um, of people who can help save lives, which are the police. Now, eventually, Chris, is this going to be available to the public? I mean, once you guys have worked the bugs out and this has been, is that your goal to make this commercially marketable? Because as Chief uh, said in the last hour, as a reporter, uh, I write a lot of stories that piss off a lot of people. And this might be something I might want to have near my office. <laughs> um, they absolutely will be. And, and when, I, when the product is done, just to make sure we're clear, we've, we've fired you know, thousands and thousands of rounds. We haven't been able to false alert the system yet. Um, so it's going into you know, production, meaning thousands of units we placed orders for um, in anticipation um, of what we plan to do with the market. But yes, we're actually going to uh, one of the largest airports in the country this month. And we're going to do a temporary install. They have an, they have an issue. We're working with commercial um, customers who have, say, things like trading floors or sensitive security areas that they need to uh, have this type of information out immediately if a shooting happens. So, yes, it will actually be available. We've hired a local um, dealer. So in every in every um, state that we're going into, which are, is all 50 and overseas, we'll have a dealer network that if you call up, they, they have one on stock, and they can come in and install it a week later. We're trying to keep this very simple. Where, where are these being physically produced? Are they being produced in the United States? Yes, they're, um, they're currently being produced both here in, in New Hampshire and California um, right now. And then we're looking to uh, expand that maybe to a couple other states as well, depending on what the need is. Can I put in a plug, because the chief won't, but can I put in a plug for maybe, you know, the Methuen area? They could use some, they could use some technology jobs in that area. Sure, I know. We're, we're certainly open to that. We're, again, just uh, just sourcing the units now, placed the first orders, and uh, we we'll certainly be looking for uh, for economic development areas as well, which is, we, we've done that in the past with military systems, with um, economic areas. There's, there's incentives, actually, to work with those folks in there, and that would be great. What is the cost to a community? I mean, I know that there's going to be grants at the beginning, but once those grants run out, communities are going to want to buy them on their own. Uh, what is the cost of the projected cost once you guys stop mass producing these things for... Um, for each of these units? Sure, so we, we don't give out the exact price point for competitive reasons um, since we believe we're first to market with the capability, but when we took a look, there's a lot of schools installing cameras, so it's at a similar, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less, uh, price point to installing a camera system in a school, um, and that's basically what we're letting people know is, is the rough idea what that is. Great. Can I jump in there for no, a minute? Ahead, please. Chris, uh, I'm glad you just mentioned the camera because we were talking earlier and uh, I really didn't address it and maybe you can talk about it. The question always comes up, well, is this going to replace uh, metal detectors and cameras and alarms on doors? And Do you want to just talk a little bit about that? Sure. We, we certainly um, we believe we have great capability, but we're not the only solution to this, to this problem. So we have set the system up to integrate with just about anything else that a school has. If they don't have anything, um, this system is a standalone system, but in the commercial market, say we've already in, in integrated with both camera systems. We can actually slew cameras to look at the shooter. We can help sound a different type of alarm, um, send notification out, which again, the chief has been a, a big help of what he 
wants to see and what he believes other chiefs will want to see. Something similar to, say, an Amber Alert that goes on everyone's text phone. We can also integrate with maps so of the school itself, and we do that. So when the police come to the location, they can actually see on the map where the shoot last shooting occurred and then listen for the sound of what's happening inside the building with a separate microphone if, if the chief and the superintendent want that. And again, it, it basically allows... It allows it to be a piece of an overall puzzle, as well as making sure we're integrated with the protocols. One of the reasons we wanted to work with um, Bethune and, and Chief Solomon and, and the Superintendent Judy was they have some significant training already done. So their their police, when they roll up, they, they know what to do. Um, so we've integrated this capability into their first response plan, which is, which is the key to the whole system. Chris Conner, I appreciate uh, you calling into the program and trying to educate our audience uh, is there anything else you want to share with us to educate people about this upcoming technology that is probably going to end up everywhere? This this sounds like if this is if you guys are successful, this sounds like this is going to be something that every school, every maybe even police department, um, and and other you know places that might be dangerous that people might not want guns to be fired, uh, concert halls, um, Foxborough, you know Fenway Park. Uh, I, I would imagine this is going to be something that's uh, that's that's going to be integrated into part of our culture. Yeah, and it's certainly a, not a short-term goal. But we've, been, we've been talking to all the local congressmen and senators. We've explained what this device is, and you know we'll be working with them over time to have some kind of regulations put in. As you know, smoke alarms were regulated in the 50s, and there hasn't been a single school um, death due to, due to fire with alarms, and early alarms being a key to that system. There's been well over 200 um, people killed in school shootings. So we're working with uh, with those folks, and hopefully down the road this will be something that's somewhat mandated in, uh, in a piece of an overall security measure when these incidents happen. Do you guys have a website? We do. It's uh, www.shooterdetectionsystems, a lot of words, but uh, .com, so it's all one word, shooterdetectionsystems.com. All right, great. Chris, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. I know it's a holiday weekend, and you should probably be off somewhere at a barbecue with your family. So thanks It's my wife's birthday, so I appreciate you letting me come on for a few minutes. But, well, uh, what's her name? I'm out of trouble, too. It's short, Jessica. so thank you. Je well, you know what? Happy birthday, Jessica. We hope you all you have a great um, birthday for the rest of the day, and I won't keep your husband any longer. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let her know. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you. Take care, Chief. All right, Chris, thanks. Talk to you later. Take we care. appreciate Bye. the support of your company helping our city. All right, 978-454-4980. I'm fascinated. I'm fascinated it's by all It's exciting, this. isn't it? It is, because yeah. you think about where this can lead. Yeah. I mean, if they can detect shotguns, what else will they be able to detect? I mean, right. Think about the, the different types of um, you know, crimes and problems that police departments have. I mean, you guys are now starting to, at least for the last few years, starting to deal with other types of threat, threats like chemical threats, right. um, bomb threats. If they can detect a gunshot, maybe they can detect they can they can detect an unexploded bomb. Maybe they can, with this technology, as it grows, as it develops, it always gets better. It always expands, right? Right. Did you ever watch Persons of Interest? That show. Oh, I did watch that once. Yes. And, you know, I know this isn't the same thing, but and of course, Person of Interest seems like Big Brother. Yeah. But isn't it amazing? And you know what? I sit there and watch it as you know. Sometimes that conspiracy theory gets into your brain, and I say. You wonder if the government really has, I mean, we, we didn't know about facial recognition for all sure. those years that they had it. And imagine if that was loaded into all public cameras, facial recognition, right. and they said, we're looking for Joe Solomon, who's just committed this heinous crime, and he's somewhere in the United States, and facial recognition ran on every single camera in the United right. States. Now, I get the privacy people flipping out over that, but... Yeah, I'm one of them. I, well, let me tell you something, Tom. I've had this conversation about... Uh, red light cameras. Remember that? Yes. We did a study back in 2006, 2004 and again in 2006, and I don't remember the numbers in my head, but start at the Salem, New Hampshire line on Route 28 and drive to the Lawrence line in that one mile strip. There was something like over a hundred times you were on camera because of private security systems in the area and ATMs. Right. So I, if we're so worried about privacy, why don't we look around and see what's already out there? How many people, I know a lot of people who actually have their alarm systems at the house, they have indoor and outdoor cameras. Right. And I was with someone the other day and they go, oh, check this out, here's my house in Maine. And the person pulled up the outside of their house, the inside of their house, then changed, turned the air conditioning on their house. And it was amazing, even at night, the infrared cameras, they could see their yard. So I understand privacy is an issue, but it's already out there because as you drive around and down the streets, I'll bet you as you walk down here in downtown Lowell, right outside here, that 
between the number of city cameras and business cameras, you couldn't walk a block without being on camera. I, I think the problem that we're having, and I'm glad you brought this up because it, it's someplace I definitely wanted to go during this discussion. Um, I think the problem that people like myself have, I'm a First Amendment guy, and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very unsettled by all these cameras going up in the Merrimack Valley, um, hoping to write a story about it in, in the coming month, is that Santander Bank may have a camera that I might be on when I'm walking by, but they're not looking for facial recognition. They're not storing who I am and where I am at that location. They're not, they don't have license plate readers that are logging where my car is at that intersection. And it's not going into a government database that can then be used against me maybe later on down the road where you know they're looking for a certain guy at a certain time and they see, oh, well, Duggan was there. Maybe he saw that guy. Yeah. Come to my house and say, well, Duggan, you were there at about the same time. Did you see the guy? I may not want to get involved. I may say, but you know, that's I, I going wanna... on. That's going on now because uh, but, when we have a crime, but it's scary. That's what I'm saying. What we do is we walk the neighbors, neighborhoods, and look at the fire where the two firemen in Boston died. Yes, they went to a business, actually a condo unit, got a camera, and from that camera, we're able to find the welding company. We, when we have crimes, not only are we going door to door asking questions and doing this, you know, the field interrogation, we ask, do you have a camera? Yeah. And then we'll say, and it's funny that you say that, because we'll like, who's that person? Oh, that's Billy Jones down the street. He lives at 18 Maple Street. We go and see Billy and say, Billy, you walked by yesterday at 1 o'clock. Did you happen to notice anything suspicious? He goes, well, you know, I heard some glass breaking and I saw a green van, but I really didn't get the plate. But, and, and I know on the privacy side it's here, but yeah, I don't want the cops knocking on my door because wow. I, right, that's yeah. amazing though, yeah, isn't it? What we could solve, and how about this? Back in uh, 1996, we had uh, a child killed on um, Washington Street, hit and run. And I was talking to a state trooper and he said, hey, why don't you call NASA? And I go, like, started to laugh at him, like, yeah, okay, I'm going to get on the phone and call NASA. He goes, no. He goes, I'm serious. I was a lieutenant at the time doing action reconstruction. He goes, call NASA because as the satellites fly over, they take pictures around the world and around the country. So we called them to say, at this time, here's the location. They looked up the latitude and Was there a satellite over? Because what I didn't realize was that satellite can be zoomed in yep. from an old video and actually tell you what the license plate was of a car going by. And unfortunately, they didn't have one. But I, I, wow, I think of how many years ago that was. I got a great story for you that totally confirms what you just said. I was driving a taxi. I was driving airport limo for end of a uh, end of a livery at the time. The night that OJ killed his wife, mm -hmm. I picked up two guys at Logan Airport. One of them was law enforcement, but he was federal law enforcement. And he gets in the car with his friend who had come in from a different flight, and they're having a conversation in the back seat. And the guy says to his friend. Did you hear about O.J.'s wife? Someone killed O.J.'s wife. He said, no, I didn't hear it because it, had, it hadn't yet hit the news, okay. right? He said, yeah, I guess they've got the satellite footage, but they're afraid that people are going to find out that they've got satellite footage of everything everybody's doing. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to find other ways to, to, to tie him to the crime. Now, I'm just a taxi driver. I'm just some dopey guy going to Northern Essex driving a taxi, listening to all this going, you know, they've got to be having this conversation for my benefit because it just sounds so outrageous. Right. But an hour later, breaking news comes on the radio after I dropped them off. They suspect O.J. Simpson might have killed his wife. Mm -hmm. Now, they didn't say O.J. Simpson's wife is dead. They're looking for the suspect. They said, we think O.J. Simpson killed his wife. And I, it automatically brought that conversation back that even back then, now I can't remember what year that was, 90, maybe 5, 96? Mm -hmm. Right in that time frame right? of my hit and run. They were already using satellite footage over neighborhoods, over cities, over towns, and taking pictures, and law enforcement was already using it. They would just weren't telling anybody. Right. Well, look at the um, shot detection system, the Boomerang and the Boomerang X was being used in Iran, I'm sorry, Iran, Iraq and Afghanistan. So at least 10, 12 years ago, this technology existed. Right. We're just behind the eight ball finding out about it. And you know, one of the interesting things for us too with this is that most law enforcement um, Ingenuity starts on the west coast and comes east. Mm -hmm. For this time, it starts on the east coast and it can go west. That's so great. That's one up on the west coast that we have. Are you time. worried? Because I am. Are you worried about the militarization? I'm not as worried as the, as the conspiracy nuts. Um, but are you worried about the militarization of, of police where we've got NEMLAC, and I'd like to talk about that a little after the first break, after this sure. next break, um, where we're, we're basically making police officers army men. We're basically making them Marines. And when we watch what happened in Boston, and I mean, you certainly have had a couple of instances in the film where you, you've had those big tanks come in yes. for certain situations. Do you worry, though, that we are now militarizing our urban areas, our suburban areas? 
Well, you know, it's, you know, there's a personal opinion and there's a police chief's opinion. Well, I just like the police chief's opinion. And I'll give you the police chief's opinion. Uh, I have concern, but I don't have worry. And what it all comes down to is who's in charge. Mm -hmm. So you have to have your trusted leader. And that's where this time the politician should be watching over our law enforcement. And, you know, I've never hid, hidden from the press uh, or from any of, we've had to go around with the Second Amendment people, we've had some First Amendment people come around at us, um, and we're open, we're there. You know, it is a concern, but here's what I look at. When we're actually out in the street, and now we're moving into a location where we know there's barricaded doors, the people inside may be armed, and we're either serving a warrant or we're trying to get in to extract a person that's inside the house, why would I not want my officers behind an armored vehicle? Uh, again, there's no rifles on the armored vehicle, but behind an armored vehicle or inside an armored vehicle that can stop around because most of the old SWAT vehicles we used, they could stop a round or two, but that was it. These armored vehicles will continually stop rounds. Mm -hmm. Why would I want not want my officers in that vehicle as they made the approach and then behind armor got armor protected shields moving to the building behind a shield with their armor protection helmets and gear because it isn't worth losing an officer to get into that house um, why would I want to lose an officer to save another person I know it's our job and we do it and I've done it myself I've gone in those houses 15 18 25 years ago 25 years ago I remember going into a house on the west end of town me and another rookie patrolman when the supervisor said the guy shot at his wife, he's in the attic, go in and get him. Bulletproof vest, routine bulletproof <laughs> vest, no armor, right. no helmet, with a uh, 357 a Smith and, and Ruger six-shot pistol. Right. Both of us worked our way to the guy's attic, and luckily he put his 9 millimeter semi-automatic weapon down and surrendered to us. Today, we would call in Nemlik or our special operations team, which we haven't been doing, all geared up behind some armor and have them go in the house because they train monthly, they're, they, they're expert shots, they carry flashbangs. So, yes, there is a concern, and you know what? You have to be crazy if you believe there isn't a concern because concern is what keeps everybody straight. Oversight right. keeps us doing the right things. And the day we make a mistake and we do something wrong, call us on it, and I'll admit it, and we'll correct it. Right. And But the day you guys make a mistake, someone dies, and that's the problem. Well, you know what? It, it may be. It doesn't necessarily mean you made a mistake and somebody dies. It, it, it can result in injury or could result in no injury. But we have to make the best decisions we make based upon all our tactical training. And, you know, I, get criti I have been criticized for 12 years because I don't sit in the desk. Why are you out there at the scene? One, you open yourself up to more liability. But right. if you have your command staff or your chief, even my captains, out at a scene, you have the oversight that you need. That's why we need to have trusted leaders in place. But yes, there is a concern about over-militarization of law enforcement, but isn't it just a response to what we're seeing? When did you see criminals on the streets with fully automatic AK-47s or M4 rifles or flashbangs or hand grenades or pull over a car with six rifles and five handguns? Sure. As you look around the country, you see that. What did we see 25, 28 years ago? We saw five guys fighting and everybody had a gun, right. but they all had one gun. Right. And they were using handguns and mainly revolvers. Today, they could have a handgun with a 10, 12, 15 round magazine. I just saw a Glock uh, 229 magazine that's a 30 round capacity wow. magazine. So somebody could have possessed these. So if I go to a domestic and there's two people at the domestic, I want four cops. So if I go somewhere and you have a knife, I want a handgun. If you have a handgun, I want a rifle. If you've got a rifle, I want an armored vehicle. Right. We always need to be one step ahead in tr with the I intent of keeping people safe. See, I'm of, I'm of two minds of this because I, I agree with you. The, the criminals are outgunning the cops. They've got better equipment. They've got better ammunition. They've got better guns. They have more access to more guns. Um, on the other hand, though, the, the First Amendment guy inside of me sees this Nemlek situation mm -hmm. where they won't even tell anybody what they're spending. They've, they've, they've created this semi-private public organization that they're claiming is private. I don't know that I buy that. Um, and I support them. Like, I know a lot of, I know Methuen's part of it, and yes. I know a lot of guys on that unit. I love those guys because if someone's holding my daughter hostage, I want those guys to show up. I agree. The concern, though, is that because politicians are in charge, and because they're civilian politicians who run the show, that, that are the ones that, that you know basically give police their orders most of the time, that it can be abused. That it can be used for maybe political purposes, or that it can be abused for other 
things. What is your experience? Well, actually, I, and I like that you brought that up because NEMLIC, which is the Northeast Massachusetts Law Enforcement Council, Methuen has been a charter member since its origination over 30 years ago. And I sit on their board because all the chiefs sit on their board. NEMLIC will not come into a community without the police chief calling. So my mayor, my city council president, uh, my local activist, Linda Susie cannot call Nemlik and say, come in and patrol or take the situation. And when Nemlik, based on their charter, when Nemlik responds to Methuen, which they have on many occasions to aid us, they are under the control and direction of the local police chief. So I could say to so them... So they're not their own, because I'm reading all this ACLU stuff, and I agree with some of their concerns, I just don't think it's going to go where they think it's going to go. You know, their concern is that these guys are... You know, uh, some rogue separate agency that is a, a conglomeration of cops from different departments who, you know, think that, you know, they're the Marines now and they just kind of go in and do what they want to do. You're saying that's not true. They come in and they're under the direct control of the police chief in that community. Correct. And see, they're giving you half truths. It is a conglomerate of 54 different police departments and two sheriff's departments. However, if I called them and said, I have a barricaded subject at, you know, 90 Hampshire Street. I'm using the police address, and the person's barricaded, and I need a SWAT team to respond. When they arrive, there's a SWAT commander who's, there's two police chiefs, uh, the Wilmington police chief um, and the Tewksbury police chief, and there is a third police chief uh, from the SWAT unit, and I can't remember what city's from, but I deal with the two Tewksbury and Wilmington chiefs. They'll arrive, and they'll say, Chief, what do you want us to do? I'll say, I want you to negotiate, and I want everyone else to stand back, and we'll negotiate. And then I'll say, you know what, I can't get any further where we are. What is your expert advice? And they'll give us the advice, but the final call is mine. If I decide not to go in, they don't go in. So they are under the control of the local chief, so we, we can be comfortable that your local city chief is actually controlling what's going on. All right, I guess we're supposed to be going to a break. How long has Mr. Shakira been playing? A few minutes. All right, very good. I apologize to those at home. I had the monitor down because I was just so... I'm, I'm fascinated by Chief Joe Solomon for a couple of reasons. One is that he's so open about everything that's going on. And it's very hard to get a police chief who just calls it like it is and says openly exactly what's going on without couching every word and trying to sound like a politician. Uh, and the other reason is because he likes us and he comes in and he talks to us. So well, when we come back, I'm going to ask the chief, get ready for your answers now. I want to talk All about right. drugs, drugs in the Merrimack Valley, the drug epidemic. Uh, is it a health issue? Is it a police issue? We'll talk about all that when we come back. Here on Paying Attention, where everybody gets it, even Ray on the line has probably been there for about 25 minutes. We'll get to you, Ray. I promise. How'd they go from Alan West and Nick Kalafalis? <laughs> One of these things is not like the other. If you've never been to Boston, you got to see our town. We got some famous places and we know the world around. And when you come to Boston, there's so many things that you can do. So many things that you can do. But there ain't no such thing. Another Methuen guy. There's another Methuen guy, Chief. Oh, We're doing is? a whole Methuen theme today. This is Rick Pisano. Oh, very good. From Methuen. He's a blues singer. Nice voice. He's got a great, he's got a very unique voice, which is what I like. Mm. That rasp to it. Yeah, I like that a lot. For, for blues, anyway. I think yeah. he was doing a different kind of music. It, it might not work. Might not but. work. 978-454-4980 is the number. We uh, will take your questions via Twitter. We will take your phone calls if you'd like to uh, call in and ask a question. But we've got about uh, 15 minutes left, and I really want to touch on this. I, we could do a whole two hours. Is, is Weaver coming in? Uh, I think so. He is coming in. Yeah, figures. <laughs> the, day, the day I could use the extra hour, he shows up. And when I don't, he doesn't show up. Uh, before I ask my questions on the drug issue, Ray has been very patient, and I appreciate you being on the line. I didn't realize you were on the line because I didn't look at Chris for like 20 minutes, and I should have. Go ahead, Ray, with your question for uh, Chief Solomon from Methuen. Sure, sure. Hi, Joe. Listen, I, I could ask a question. Have, has anybody ever considered that maybe, um, I, I mean, why we know about the AWACS at this point, we know about all the technology that's available, and for years how the different law enforcement agencies haven't really um, shared information for one reason or another, uh, and it's, it's been turned around for, for a number of years now, and we're working more in that direction. But, like, when we build a building like a school, some of these technologies, you would think that they would integrate it right into it. Like we were discussing the uh, the, the the fact that the children aren't dying now because of fires, because uh, we have uh, alarm systems built in for fire prevention. Um, 
when you have something like um, this detection device, I, it would almost seem to be enhanced to turn around and put something like maybe the ones that they have for uh, what we have in the military for uh, gunpowder detection uh, on the on the kids' clothes. If they're anywhere near uh, gunpowder or uh, any explosive uh, material, then it, it alerts so that we get a, a heads up. And I think the proactive aspect of everything, and I, I'm sure I only have to ask Joe because I think you probably agree, is, is the way to go with this and the, high, the more steps up ahead we are what the cost we have and then some people don't even uh, grasp that and some people get very offended by uh, losing the, the, the trade-offs but I think human life has a, has a greater value than maybe losing it. I think the most hysterical story real quick uh, I was in Germany I was an MP for a long time and it sat there with a soup so now here, I'm, I'm like the equivalent of a, uh, a chief. So now I'm coming out of my housing area and I'm late. I get hit on an infrared camera. And over there, the cameras come and the photographs come and there I am in full MP uniform, quite embarrassing. And the photograph comes to you with your license plate number, your speed, and it, it's just absolutely no way of fighting this and you, it gets cut right to your command. Um, Do you have I a question like this for kind of stuff, even though it, it, the more technology we can put out there, the less uh, we have to tie up the manpower, and these things like that are a given. Uh, I, I messed up. Ray, I know you were on hold. Ray, I know you were on hold for a long time. Did you have a question? Uh, I'll let you go and feedback on this now. Sure. Right, thank you, Ray. Ray, thank you for calling. And you know what I did find interesting in your question at the beginning was. Shouldn't this become, shouldn't these new technologies become requirements? And uh, I was invited to uh, testify for the uh, Governor's School Safety Council probably three or four months ago. And I testified about early detection and warning of behavioral um, issues and of technology. And I gave a presentation on the uh, study that we've done on a shooter detection system in a school and what that shooter detection system can mean. And our hope is that when the Governor's Council issues, um, the Governor's Committee, which is a cross-secretarial uh, committee, uh, issues its findings that we believe they're going to say that new technologies that help detect uh, weapons and that help detect shots similar to the smoke detector for gunshots will be part of those recommendations. So uh, we're all watching for that report and it should be out any single day. And uh, thank you for calling and asking that question. 978-454-4980. Chief, we talked for about two hours one day, I think maybe the last time you were on the program, about the drug issue in the Merrimack Valley. Um, it, 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 in ten minutes left, I mean, we can't even begin to touch what I wanted to do, um, but this has been so fascinating, and I just kind of want to wrap up with this. You have seen, because of the location of Methuen, because 93 is right there, 495 is right there, you've got the 213 interchange, you're right on the border of New, New Hampshire. You guys are perfectly located for drug dealers. Absolutely. I mean, they love, and I've even talked to some when I chase police calls and they're being locked up and we chat with them. They love Methuen. They love Methuen because it doesn't have the reputation of Lawrence. It's got a lot of really high-priced neighborhoods where they can pull in quietly and they can do their deal where they think no one's going to cause them any problems. It's centrally located with 28, well, as I said, 213, 495. Um, how are you handling that? I mean, I've seen the huge influx of drug dealing and drug use in the Methuen area. How are you guys handling it? Well, good question, Tom. And, and you know, earlier I talked about layers of defense. So we use layers. Um, back uh, when I noticed the uh, large overdoses, you know, just before Christmas time, I had asked for a regional chiefs meeting. We brought Havel, Lawrence, Methuen, uh, Salem, New Hampshire, uh, Andover, North Andover together, and we put together our task force because it's a mobile issue and it affects the Merrimack Valley. So what we're doing is in Methuen we doubled the size of our drug task force in uh, Methuen offices. We've also forged all those relationships so everybody's working together monthly. We're communicating info and we even did an operation where we worked in each other's cities, which I found to be very valuable and I had done it back in the late 90s with Lowell and Havel and I thought it worked exchanging offices. How does that help you in Methuen having worked in another community like Lowell or Lawrence? Well, what it helps is what we find is 
my user goes to your city to buy or my dealer goes to your city to sell and the anonymity of being able to be in a city and no one knows who you are so now you have offices from all the Merrimack Valley working together and in the other cities and they look and say, whoa, there's Joe Solomon. Hey, he's one of our dealers or, hey, I locked him up last week for using. So they start following him and it takes away that anonymity. The other part is it's a shared of information and Ray also mentioned about shouldn't we share info? And yeah. we are sharing info and that call. works really well. So that's part of it. Um, we also work with the Essex County Sheriff's Department and they have a sergeant who's assigned to a DEA task force and we have an officer assigned to an FBI task force so we've been able to bring those groups in. But that's the police side. Now we talked about before, what about the human services side? Well, Diana DeZoglio, Representative DeZoglio, started the Mary Mac Valley Substance Abuse Task Force. We joined that task force with Phil Leahy and it's grown. Gray Lawrence Mental Health is in it. We have monthly meetings. We're preparing, I believe the date is September 23rd. Uh, we're going to do, and I can double check the date for you, we're going to do a big event at the Armory, which is public education, because we were having our pre-conversation off the air and it's like, oh my god, I didn't know this person was using and this person's close to me and I hear this from parents all the time. Oh, I didn't think there was anything wrong with my son. I know he changed a little, but he's growing. He's getting big, and this is what happens. No, this was your son using drugs. Did right. you realize 17 pieces of jewelry were missing from your house? Right, right. And did you realize this? So we're going to do this big education program with the Mary Mac Valley Substance Abuse um, Task Force, which I'm a member of, and it's going to be at the Armory at the end of September. And the goal is to educate parents what can you do and to show you source resources. The other thing is, as part of this task force, we had a uh, man come to us, and I, I could wish I could remember his name, but it's called Heaven for Hope. He took over the old St. Uh, Carmel School, okay. and he's going to make that a sober house for women. And I think there's between 20 Isn't and 30 sexist? beds. And, That's sexist. Well, you know what, Tom? And you know what his reason? He had a couple of reasons for it. And one of them is, if we had a sober house for men, would the neighbors go wild? And they'd be, oh, there's going to be sex offenders there, there's going right, to be right, male right. drug addicts. And he's faith-based. And as we look, and, and I look back, the origins of community policing and Weed and Seed was the faith-based organization. Right. God forbid we say God in a public building. Right. God forbid we pray. Right. I mean, but you know what? What happened, as we've seen from the 50s moving forward, is as the faith-based has moved away, crime and disorder and drug has increased. So a faith-based organization like this Heaven for Hope will help at least those women. But it gives us somewhere we could say, we have somebody who's detoxing, will you take them? So what we're working with the Merrimack Valley Drug Task Force, um, uh, Rehabilitation Task Force, is giving, giving us beds to put someone who needs help and giving right. resources to, I'm a parent with children, you're a parent, someone who has young children, who can you go to to find education? What is a drug look like? What are the signs and symptoms? Mm -hmm. what, should I, what questions could I ask my kid? If I see my child's phone and it has certain words on it, right. are those words the name of a drug or is it some type of a secret code they're using? So um, we have to worry about the individual. We have to focus on behavioral and social services because law enforcement alone is not going to solve the problem. We're going to solve the problem through social services. And this is the nice side of law enforcement. Right. Do you guys, able to care about people. Do you guys just know, I know that you, you took a lot of crap nationally for arresting the Facebook the the, the Facebook terrorist. Yes. Um, but I'm wondering though, as we go through these conversations today, how you guys use social media when you're trying to track drugs, when you're trying to track drug dealers. Are you guys monitoring their Twitter accounts? Are you looking to see where their activities, if they're checking in at, um, you know, TGI Fridays at the Loop? But you know they're a drug dealer from you know Westford somewhere. Right. Um, are you guys u currently using that kind of technology to kind of monitor people that you know are, maybe they are not committing a crime right now, but you know that they're involved in, in, in criminal activity? Well, we do, and we also, uh, we, we're aware of a website that's used. Uh, it's similar to um, Craigslist, but it's a local website where stolen, when kids steal items, they put them up there for sale. So we watch that constantly, but we're also watching our social media. But you know what the bigger part of social media is? The messages we receive. I received two messages last week through social media. Hey, check out this person. When I went to their website, they had drug paraphernalia and drugs, marijuana growing in their apartment uh, in our city, openly showing it and talking about it for sale. So right. that I gave it to my drug unit. Now we do it manually, but we've been working with a company called Media Sonar for about four months and we were ready to sign a contract with them, but uh, it was the end of the fiscal year. So we're going to go back to them. And this not only is it for 
monitoring it for crimes being committed, like for drug dealing, but for safety of children and crime security. This media sonar, in a major incident, a flood, um, the storm the other night, God forbid, uh, a shooting at some location, we'll be able to use our media sonar, pull up that geographical area on a map, and see every public treat, tweet or every public Facebook post or Instagram picture that comes out. and From on, that area? From that area. That's or we amazing. can look at the whole world, but we could zoom in on that area. And then what I found is, if you get the law enforcement version and say it's in WCAP's building, I could zoom in and say it's the second floor, third window from the right, the person's in that office. They might be saying, help, I need help, I'm right, here. Right. It's going to pinpoint their location in the wow. building. So mm -hmm. the, the technology that's out there is unbelievable. So Do we're you worry about abuse? I mean, I know you're not an abusive oh. chief, but God forbid you leave tomorrow, Methuen gets some nutcase who is, you know, who, who just has no respect for our privacy. Mm -hmm. You said with Nemlek it, it, it's up to the chiefs that, that run it. And I think what the privacy concerns, the First Amendment concerns that people like me have is, what happens if we get a guy who's not a Joe Solomon? How, can it be abused? Do you worry about that? There, there, is a, there is a possibility for abuse, but that's why we have you. People like Tommy Duggan are going to fight and find out what's going on and talk about the First Amendment and the Second Amendment and the abuses that might be going on. That's where it's important. The news media has to watch us. And believe me, we all know I was beaten and battered for like four years. But guess what? I survived and I'm back here. So... It's hard well, I was to see fair, it sometimes. Though. You were fair. Yeah. Some other press wasn't oh, fair. Oh, I see. I see. But, um, and I have to say, and I didn't mean that about Tom Duggan. You right. were very fair to me. You reported the facts and let people make the decisions. But we need people like you, and we need our citizens to stand up and say, ask the question. Show up at city council. I'm not happy with this, and I want some answers. Right. Demand your, your law enforcement leaders show up at your city council and be accountable. And I'll be there every time someone has a question. We've got three minutes left. Tell us something people don't know. Give us some breaking news. Tell us something that's going on in Methuen that people aren't talking about that once you say it, we're going to be able to get people to talk about. Well, it's interesting because I talked about like the biggest things that we had, which was the uh, new shot detection system. That was really the biggest focus that we had. And uh, I think everybody knows about our new school. And I'll talk about something schools because it's exciting to me. I knew high school will be opened in September. And uh, I think it's just phenomenal to have walked through that building and see the commitment the city and the school did to our children. Because it's not all about law enforcement when you're the police chief. It's about it's about the whole community and, and really anyone who has an opportunity to go to a high school and check out what the superintendent and the mayor have done there is phenomenal we welcome them down there uh, i wish i had some other new great breaking news but my biggest news came in the beginning of your show how long is your contract i have a three-year contract uh which only covers till salary under civil service i'm here till si i'm 65 if i wish uh, my plan is to stay the next five years and then reassess at five years when I'll reach my uh, retirement. Yeah, we don't want you to go. Okay, well, thank you. If I start to find out, I've, and I'll hear before you tell me, if I start to find out you're thinking of leaving for any reason, I'm going to come down on you. Well, thank you. Because I appreciate you're, Well, you're a great asset to the community, not just to the Valley Patriot or to WCAP, because unlike most police chiefs, they don't want to talk about this stuff. They're very parochial, and I know you know this because you've been to chief conferences well, you get the snot kicked out of you by other police chiefs mm -hmm. for letting stuff out on Twitter about what your department is doing. Correct. You know, absolutely. I've taken a lot of heat from police chiefs for uh, doing school lockdowns back when we were doing them with SWAT teams and for using social media. But if I could close with something that's really important to me, sure. dear, and to my heart, I just want to thank everyone that works for me, uh, both sworn and uh, civilian. As we just saw the other night at the fireworks, uh, over 30 officers assigned to the fireworks, uh, 10 officers on the shift, and then all hell broke loose with the storm. And we had to order some officers in on a holiday, uh, the day before a holiday. Our civilians were there. I, I'm. People always say all the time about, wow, you're successful, you do a great job. But you know what? I, I just reap the rewards of the people that work for me and truly from my heart. In the past three and a half years, I'm so proud of the officers and the civilian staff I have. It means a lot to me. And I'm the guy who comes down on everybody. I never get to say thank you to them. So I'd like to take today as a chance to say thank you to everybody that works for me. And a special thank you to their family. Because their family, their husbands, wives, and their children, and their partners, miss them the most when they're working for us. And thank you for having me on today. And you're welcome. You read the Valley Patriot? I read it all the time. And you live in Bethlehem. And I live in Bethlehem. That just goes to show that Steve Zani's full of crap. <laughs> he called into my show one day and he said... He said, no, nah, I'm not going to do this. Nobody, nobody reads your paper. No one listens well, to your show. Well, I read show. your paper and I listen to your show. And you live in Methuen. And I live a police in chief who lives in his own community where the drug yeah. dealers and the criminals know where he is, 
that takes a lot of guts, and I have a lot of respect for you. Thank you very much, Chief Solomon, for coming in. The podcast will be up probably within the hour, and then I got to get to bed because I'm working. I'm going to be working straight through the next three days. Well, we don't have drugs in Westford. You know, no Jeez. drugs in Westford. Tom Weaver, the classical liberal, is coming up next. Hopefully, he can incorporate some of what we talked about today in his show. <laughs> Melvin Taylor says, "Go home." So go home already. That's all right. I can't but make sure you keep tuning in for Tom Weaver, the classical liberal. Did you ever find Davy Crockett's musket? No. Damn it.